Hi, today on Viva Bites we are talking about canalisation. Um, so the source that I'm using is Charlu 1991, Canalisation, uh, Genetic and Developmental Aspects, so it's quite a good review. Um, so canalisation, the concept was first developed, uh, well, the, the term was first coined in 1942 by Waddington in the context of developmental biology. Um, so canalisation is defined as a measure of the ability of a population to produce the same phenotype regardless of the variability of its environment or genotype. It is a form of evolutionary robustness. Waddington emphasised two points during organism development. First, uh, the end products are sharply distinct, there are no intergradations. And secondly, the normal course of development is the preferred path. Deviations from this path, uh, whether due to internal or external environmental disturbances, are corrected by regulatory processes. And this is true of distinct types of tissue, but also at the organismic level. Waddington coined the term epigenetic landscape to picture the concept of canalisation of developmental pathways. So the metaphor goes uh, as this. The development starts in the egg. Many developmental pathways branch out, uh, so this would represent the great variety of distinct end results. Um, and these pathways are represented as branching valleys uh, that are in a descending slope. Uh, such a valley is called a creod. The developmental processes are then visualised as balls rolling down the valleys to their end point. Um, so when you try and push the ball away from its course along the valley bottom, um, and this would be internal or the external disturbances acting upon it, then if you've got a steep valley uh, and large ridges separating the valleys, then the, um, the ball will return to the original course, going back down the, the bottom of the valley. The epigenetic landscape is generated by the interaction of many gene-controlled processes. Warnington worked on Drosophila genetic assimilation of environmentally induced phenotypes, and this got people quite excited because it reconciled two theories at, that were at odds. So, You've got on the one hand the Lamarckian processes where environmental affects the phenotype and on the other you've got Mendelian inheritance of traits. Um, just as a side note, the definition of genetic assimilation is an environmentally induced phenotype uh, which has become inherited. So, canalisation and the inheritance of acquired characters. Waddington starts by suggesting that sensitivity of characters to environmental factors is actually genetically based, um, i.e. the ability to respond to external stimulus is under genetic control. Goldschmidt and Landauer separately showed that genetic variation in environmental response um, by performing uh, phenocopy experiments, uh, so they applied chemicals or environmental extremes generated morphological anomalies to the wing that were similar to known mutants. Coming on to canalisation and genetic assimilation. Um, so the first experiments uh, involved heat shocking at 40 degrees for about 4 hours, um, 20 to 23 hours APF after preparing formation, um, and this produced incomplete cross veins uh, or none at all. Um, the, these were experiments by Waddington, by the way, I should have mentioned. This character, partial or absence of cross veins, is a phenocopy of several known mutants, and the phenocopy occurred with a 40% frequency. Waddington then started two selection lines. In the first, so flies that lacked cross veins due to the heat shock became the parents of the next generation, and the second line, the flies that didn't react to the heat shock became parents of the next generation. Um, the result was that more and fewer flies respectively showed uh, cross veinless phenotypes. Um, after 12 generations, the cross veinless phenotypes had become some 55% uh, of the population, and in each generation, a larger number of flies were grown lacking cross veins without being heat shocked. So, Warrington called this uh, genetic assimilation. 
genetic fixation of a phenotypic reaction uh, to an environmental factor. Waddington suggested that genetic variation is present in the base population at the start of the experiment. Long inbred lines that approach genetic homogeneity didn't show any change in the frequency of the heat shock induced cross veinless phenotype under the same selection regime. Um, so Batman, or ba Bateman, I should probably say Bateman, um, so she, she was a PhD student working uh, with Waddington as a supervisor and she was able to repeat Waddington's first cross veinless assimilation experiment. Um, and she also found that some flies spontaneously presented the cross veinless phenotype from the start. So some already lacked cross veins due to uh, genetic alleles. Glor obtained phenocopies of Bythorix mutants of Drosophila by submitting eggs to ether vapour. Heat shock applied to the same developmental stage caused similar phenotypes. Um, so the results were that the third thoracic segment, which uh, normally carries whole tears, was transformed into a full second thoracic segment with wings. 22 generations later uh, of selection, uh, Bythorix phenotypes uh, started appearing spontaneously. But there is a question that remains regarding uh, canalization and assimilation. Are they necessarily linked? Uh, so just going on Wikipedia here rather than Charlu, um, it is possible to explain genetic assimilation using only quantitative genetics and a sort of threshold model without any reference to the concept of canalization at all. Um, however, theoretical models that incorporate a complex genotype to phenotype map have found evidence for the evolution of phenotypic robustness contributing to uh, genetic assimilation, even when selection is only for developmental stability and not for a particular phenotype. Um, and so the, the quantitative genetics model doesn't apply in this case. So these studies suggest that canalization that the canalization heuristic may still be useful um, beyond the more simple concept of robustness. Uh, coming back to Charlu 1991, so Bateman uh, explained the results of the cross veinless experiment as a simple threshold model, uh, a model um, that was also presented by Falconer, where the percentage of flies lacking cross veins is a part of the distribution above this threshold. To increase the frequency of the cross veinless allele um, in the population, you need to either uh, see a shift in the mean of the distribution, an increase in the variance, or a shift of the threshold. Um, they are not mutually exclusive either. Kirchstern uh, also suggested a threshold system, but stated that Waddington's basic assumptions were not necessarily valid. Instead, he presented a simple single locus model involving the recessive Drosophila mutant cubitus interruptus, um, CI in short. Um, so, imagine a population which has genes promoting a certain phenotype in two environments, but their selection only occurs in the second environment because the threshold stops their expression in the first. Selection for these genes causes their accumulation, ultimately leading to their expression in the first environment. Um, in reply, Waddington answered, uh, yes, genetic assimilation can be explained by such a threshold model, but he saw it as the, uh, and I quote, told to the children version, um, end of quote. This model doesn't explain why selection would cause accumulation in the first environment. Um, I'm not entirely clear on this. Um, Coming on to genetic variation in phenotypic reactions, uh, so Waddington 1959 uh, did two experiments, um, one where he did uh, a canalizing selection and one where he did uh, genetic assimilation. So the canalization selection experiment. Uh, so he applied artificial selection to try and change the sensitivity for temperature of uh, eye facet number in the Drosophila mutant bar, B-A-R. Uh, the rationale for this was that previously all experiments on genetic assimilation were done via artificial selection but had no clear adaptive significance 
until now. Now there was adaptive significance. And the second uh, experiment is one on the genetic assimilation um, to increase size of the anal papillae in Drosophila melanogaster larvae when exposed to salt in food um, because the papillae are involved in osmoregulation. Previously, experiments looked at binary threshold characters. Now they were looking at uh, well, they were looking to see whether assimilation occurred in quantitative continuous characters. Um, the issue is that Waddington got it a bit wrong. He didn't. He wasn't actually measuring anal papillae at all. Uh, instead, he was measuring the distance between them. Uh, so you've got a, a sort of inverse relationship at, at best. Um, but even with this uh, mistake, Papillae did respond in a graded fashion, so the point still holds. 